Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Man with the Twisted Lip Mr. Isa Whitney was, and had been for many years, an opium addict. He could not get rid of the habit. He had once been a fine man, but now people only pitied this bent, unfortunate person with the yellow, unhealthy face. Opium was both his ruin and his only pleasure. One night in June, when it was almost time to go to bed, I heard the doorbell ring. I sat up in my chair, and Mary, my wife, put her sewing down, in annoyance. A patient, she said, at this hour. We heard the servant open the front door and speak to someone. A moment later, the door of our sitting room was thrown open, and a lady came in. She wore a black veil over her face. Please forgive me for calling on you so late, she began. But then she could no longer control her feelings. She ran forward, threw her arms round Mary's neck, and cried bitterly on her shoulder. Oh, I'm in such trouble, she said. I need help so much. Well, said my wife, pulling up the visitor's veil. It's Kate Whitney. This is a surprise, Kate. I had no idea who you were when you came in. I didn't know what to do, and so I came straight to you. That was how it always happened. People who were in trouble came to my wife like birds to a lighthouse. We are very glad to see you, Mary said. Now you must have some wine and water, and sit here comfortably, and tell us all about it. Oh, R, would you like me to send John off to bed? Oh, no, no. I want the doctor's advice and help, too. It's about Isa. He hasn't been home for two days. I'm so worried about him. This was not the first time that Mrs. Whitney had spoken to us of her husband's bad ways. She and Mary had been at school together. We did our best to calm her down and comfort her. Have you any idea where he has gone? I asked. Yes, Mrs. Whitney replied. He's probably at a place called the Bar of Gold in East London, down by the river. It's in Upper Swandham Street. It's a place where opium addicts go. This is the first time that Isa has spent more than a day there. I was Isa Whitney's doctor and had a certain influence with him. I will go to this place, I said. If he is there, I will send him home in a carriage within two hours. Five minutes later, I had left my comfortable chair and sitting room and was in a fast carriage on my way east. Upper Swandham Street was on the north side of the river to the east of London Bridge. The bar of gold was below the level of the street some steep steps led down to the entrance, which was little more than a hole in the wall. There was an oil lamp hanging above the door. I ordered the driver to wait, and went down the steps. Inside, it was difficult to see very much through the thick brown opium smoke. Wooden beds lined the walls of a long, low room. In the shadows, I could just see bodies lying in strange positions on the beds and little red circles of light burning in the bowls of metal pipes. Most of the smokers lay silently, but some talked softly to themselves. 
Near one end of the room was a fireplace, in which a small fire was burning. A tall, thin old man sat there, his elbows on his knees looking into the fire. A Malayan servant who belonged to the place came up to me with some opium and a pipe. He pointed to an empty bed. No, thank you, I said. I haven't come to stay. There is a friend of mine here, Mr. Isa Whitney, and I want to speak to him. A man on one of the beds suddenly sat up, and I recognized Whitney. He was pale, untidy, and wild-looking. Watson, he cried. Tell me, Watson, what time is it? Nearly eleven o'clock. Oh, and what day? Friday, June the 19th. Good heavens, I thought it was Wednesday. No, it's Friday, and your wife has been waiting two days for you. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. He began to cry. I was sure I had been here only a few hours, but I'll go home with you. I don't want to worry Kate. Poor little Kate. Give me your hand. I can't do anything for myself. Have you come in a carriage? Yes, I have one waiting. Good, but I must owe something here. Find out what I owe them, Watson. As I walked along the narrow passage between the beds, looking for the manager, I felt someone touch my arm. It was the tall man by the fire. Walk past me, and then look back at me, he said. When I looked again, he was still leaning over the fire, a bent, tired old man. Suddenly he looked up and smiled at me. I recognized Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, I whispered. What on earth are you doing in this terrible place? Speak more quietly. I have excellent ears. Please get rid of that friend of yours. I want to talk to you. I have a carriage waiting outside. Then send him home in it. And I suggest that you give the driver a note for your wife. Tell her you are with me. And wait outside for me. I'll be with you in five minutes. In a few minutes I had written my note, paid Whitney's bill, led him out to the carriage and said good night to him. Then Holmes came out of the bar of gold and we walked along together. At first he walked unsteadily, with a bent back, but after the first few streets he straightened up and laughed loudly. I suppose you think I have become an opium addict, Watson, he said. I was certainly surprised to find you in that place, I replied, and I was surprised to see you there. I came to find a friend and I came to find an enemy. An enemy? Yes, Watson, one of my natural enemies, a criminal. I am working on one of my cases. I fear that M. R. Neville St. Clair entered the Bat of Gold, and that he will never come out of the place alive. There is a door at the back of the building that opens onto the river. I believe that many men have been murdered there, and that their bodies have been thrown out through that door. If I had been recognized, the evil Indian sailor who owns the place would have murdered me too. I have used the bar of gold before for my own purposes, and have often found useful clues there in the conversation of the opium addicts. The owner has sworn to have his revenge on me for it. Suddenly Holmes whistled loudly. The carriage should be here by now, he said. We heard an answering whistle in the distance. Then we saw the yellow lamps of the carriage as it came near. Now, Watson, you will come with me, won't you? said Holmes, as he climbed in. If I can be of any use. Oh, a friend is always useful, and my room at the St. Clair's has two beds. At the St. Clair's? Yes, I am staying there while I work on Ohechi case. Where is it, then? Near Lee, in Kent. It's a seven-mile drive. Come on. But I don't know anything about your case. Of course you don't, but you soon will. Jump up here. All right, Harold, he said to the driver. We shan't need you. He handed the man a coin. Look out for me tomorrow at about eleven o'clock. Good night. For the first part of our drive, Holmes was silent, and I waited patiently for him to begin. I have been wondering what I can say to that dear little woman tonight when she meets me at the door, he said at last. I am talking about Mrs. St. Clair, of course. Neville St. Clair came to live near Lee five years ago. 
He took a large house and lived like a rich man. He gradually made friends in the neighborhood, and two years ago, he married the daughter of a local farmer, by whom he now has two children. Neville St. Clair was a businessman in London. He used to leave home every morning and then catch the 514 train back from Cannon Street Station each evening. If he is still alive, he is now 37 years old. He has no bad habits. He is a good husband and father, and everybody likes him. He has debts of 8 euro at present, but his bank account contains 220 euro. There is no reason, therefore, to think that he has any money troubles. Last Monday, he went into London rather earlier than usual. He said that he had two important pieces of business to do that day. He also promised to buy his little boy a box of toy bricks. Now, that same day, his wife happened to receive a telegram from the Aberdeen Shipping Company. This informed her that a valuable package which she was expecting had arrived at the company's offices in London. These offices are in Fresno Street, which is off Upper Swandham Street, where you found me tonight. Mrs. St. Clair had her lunch, caught a train to London, did some shopping, and then went to the shipping company's offices. W. Hen, she came out, it was 4.35. She walked slowly along Upper Swandham Street, hoping to find a carriage. It was a very hot day, and she did not like the neighborhood at all. Suddenly, she heard a cry and saw her husband looking down at her from a window on the first floor of one of the houses. He seemed to be waving to her, as if he wanted her to come up. The window was open, and she had a clear view of his face. He looked very worried and nervous. She noticed that he had no collar or tie on, but he was wearing a dark coat like the one he had put on that morning. Then, very suddenly, somebody seemed to pull him back from the window. Mrs. St. Clair felt sure that something was seriously wrong. She saw that the entrance to the house was below ground level. This was the door of the Bar of Gold. She rushed down the steps and through the front room and tried to go up the stairs which led to the upper part of the house. But the owner, the Indian sailor I spoke of, ran downstairs and pushed her back. The Malayan servant helped him to push her out into the street. She rushed along Upper Swandam Street and into Fresno Street, where she fortunately found several policemen. They forced their way into the Bar of Gold and went upstairs to the room in which Mr. St. Clair had last been seen. There was no sign of him there. In fact, the only person in the upper part of the house was an ugly cripple who lived there. Both the Indian and this cripple swore that no one else had been in the first floor front room that afternoon. The policemen were beginning to believe that Mrs. St. Clair had been mistaken when suddenly she noticed a small wooden box on the table. Realizing what it contained, she tore the lid off and emptied out children's bricks. It was the toy that her husband had promised to bring home for his little boy. Of course, the rooms were now examined very carefully, and the police found signs of a terrible crime. The front room was an ordinary room with plain furniture and led into a small bedroom from which the river could be seen. Along the edge of the river there is a narrow piece of ground which is dry at low tide, but which is covered at high tide by at least four and a half feet of water. At that time of day the river is at its highest point. There were drops of blood on the window, and a few drops on the bedroom floor too. Behind a curtain in the front room the police found all Neville St. Clair's clothes except his coat his shoes, his socks, his hat, and his watch. Everything was there. There were no signs of violence on any of the clothes, and Mr. St. Clair, alive or dead, was certainly not there. He seemed to have gone out of the window. There was no other possibility. The Indian had often been in trouble with the police before. But as Mrs. St. Clair had seen him at the foot of the stairs only a few seconds after her husband's appearance at the window, he could not have been responsible for the murder. He said that he knew nothing about the clothes which had been found in the cripple's rooms. The cripple himself, whose name is Hugh Boone, must have been the last person to see Neville St. Clair. Boone 
is a well-known London beggar who always sits in Threadneedle Street near the Bank of England. He pretends to be a match seller, but there is always a dirty leather cap by his side into which people throw coins. I have watched him more than once, and I have been surprised at the very large amount of money that he receives in this way. His appearance, you see, is so unusual that no one can go past without noticing him. He has a pale face and long red hair and bright brown eyes. His upper lip is twisted as the result of an old accident, and he is famous for his clever answers to the jokes of all the businessmen who go past. Is it possible that a cripple could have murdered a healthy young man like Neville St. Clair? I asked. Hugh Boone's body is bent and his face is ugly, Holmes replied, but there is great strength in him. Cripples are often very strong, you know. When the police were searching him, they noticed some spots of blood on one of the arms of his shirt, but he showed them a cut on his finger and explained that the blood had come from there. He also said that he had been at the window not long before, and that the blood on the floor and window probably came from his finger too. He refused to admit that he had ever seen Mr. St. Clair, and swore that the presence of the clothes in the room was as much a mystery to him as it was to the police. If Mrs. St. Clair said she had seen her husband at the window, she must have been dreaming or else she was crazy. Boone was taken to the police station, still complaining loudly. When the water level in the river had gone down, the police looked for the body of Mr. St. Clair in the mud, but they only found his coat, and every pocket was full of pennies and half pennies, 421 pennies, and 270 half pennies. It was not surprising that the coat had not been carried away by the tide, but possibly the body itself had been swept away. Perhaps Boone pushed St. Clair through the window and then decided to get rid of the clothing, which might give clues to the police. But he needed to be sure that the clothes would sink. So he went to the hiding place where he kept the money he earned in Threadneedle Street and began by filling the pockets of the coat and throwing it out. He would have done the same with the rest of the clothing, but just then, he heard the police coming up the stairs and quickly closed the window. Boone has been a professional beggar for many years, but he has never been in any serious trouble with the police. He seems to live very quietly and harmlessly. I have to find out what Neville St. Clair was doing in that house, what happened to him while he was there, where he is now, and what Hugh Boone's involvement was in his disappearance. The problem seemed to be an easy one at first, but now I don't think it is so easy. Do you see that light among the trees? That is the St. Clair's house. Beside that lamp an anxious woman is sitting, listening, probably, for the sound of our horse. We drove through some private grounds and stopped in front of a large house. A servant ran out to take charge of our horse. The front door opened before we had reached it and a small fair woman, in a pink silk dress, hurried out to meet us. Well, she cried eagerly, well, perhaps she thought for a moment that Holmes's friend was her lost husband. Holmes shook his head. No good news? she asked. None. But no bad news either. No. Well, come in. You must be very tired. You have had a long day's work. This is my friend Dr. Watson. He has been of great use to me in several of my cases. By a lucky chance, he has been able to come with me this evening. I am pleased to meet you, said Mrs. St. Clair, pressing my hand warmly. She led us into a pleasant dining room, where there was a cold supper laid out on the table. Now, M. R. Sherlock Holmes, I have one or two questions to ask you, and I should like you to answer them truthfully. Certainly, Mrs. St. Clair. It is your real opinion that I want to know. About what? Holmes asked. Do you truly believe that Neville is still alive? Holmes did not seem to like this question. Truly now, she repeated, looking at him as he leaned back in his chair. Truly then, I do not.
he answered at last. You think he is dead? Yes. And that he was murdered? I don't know. Perhaps. And on what day did he die?